Jujutsu Kaisen was supposed to be the chosen one. It was supposed to be the new gen battle manga that would come the closest to the big three. At one point, I believed it was better than Hero and Clover and stood aside Demon Slayer, but things have changed. There was false news that JJK was ending this year, but if it was, I realized that if JJK ended this year, it would be a huge disappointment. Most of the points I gave to this manga were based on potential, but what it's actually done is very minimal. The reason I didn't name this the fall off is because there was truly never anything to fall from. The first major issue is the plot. The arcs in JJK have side quest syndrome. I feel like most of the arcs amount to side quests that aren't focused on the main antagonist or overarching goal of collecting Sukuna's fingers. Before I get there, I'll explain the two main types of arc progressions that battle manga use. The first is what I'll call the stage type. This is where the heroes fight a new villain each arc who is the most powerful threat at the time. Stories that do this are One Piece, Bleach, and Fairy Tale. These stories usually don't have an overarching goal. The second type is the small steps type. This is where each arc has the hero making a little bit of progress on one of their overarching goals. Stories that use this are Naruto, Hero Academia, and Demon Slayer. In Naruto, each arc has the heroes getting closer to stopping Orochimaru, the Akatsuki, or saving Sasuke. In Hero, most arcs have them getting closer to the League and All for One. In Demon Slayer, most arcs have them killing Akizuki, bringing them closer to Muzan. That brings us to JJK. The main overarching objectives in JJK are to defeat Sukuna, defeat Kenjaku, and have Yuji eat all the fingers. The Fearsome Womb arc is made of multiple side quests, but I can give that a pass since other stories like Naruto and Bleach start episodic like that. The Versus Mahito arc is a side quest, so is the Goodwill event. The Death Painting arc had the Death Paintings retrieving Sukuna's fingers, so it had progress. Gojo's Pass is a flashback arc, so it has no progress made in the present despite being relevant. Shibuya Incident is the first focus arc. Itadori's Extermination is a side quest, so is Perfect Preparation. The Calling Game is a focused arc, and so is Shinjuku Showdown, but I have an issue with the former. Despite Kenjaku being the big boss here, the characters the heroes fight are complete randos. Instead of having the heroes fight a relevant villain squad, like the Kizuki, Akatsuki, Thunder Tribe, CP9, Sound 4, or Baroque Works, the sorcerers get to fight new characters who aren't even associated with Kenjaku or Sukuna, making it feel more like a side quest. Out of 10 arcs, 4 are not side quests. Maybe you're thinking that One Piece, Fairy Tail, and Black Clover do the same. In One Piece, each arc moves them either closer to the Grand Line or the One Piece. Fairy Tail doesn't have an overarching goal for its characters, so technically there are no side quests. Fairy Tail does have two overarching villains, but they remain in the shadows and the heroes aren't chasing them. Black Clover is like Fairy Tail, no objective to pursue and no overarching antagonist. People throw around the term wasted character a lot, but I have my own definition, and JJK definitely has wasted many. For a hero character to not be wasted, they need their own subplot that ends in a satisfying way. This subplot usually involves a character arc. Once that subplot is completed, that character can no longer be considered wasted in my book. Rock Lee and Shikamaru are great examples of characters that are not wasted. Lee had a subplot of proving that he's a splendid ninja. He had multiple fights within this subplot, and it seemingly ended with him getting broken by Gara. He already proved himself, but then we get the additional story of him dealing with the aftermath of his journey, and having an emotional recovery when he returns to battle, despite being told that he'd never fight again. That's a subplot that lasted multiple arcs. Shikamaru has a subplot about moving from laziness to leadership. In the tune-in exams, he's super lazy, but by the end, he decides to sacrifice himself, a leader-like move. Then in the Sasuke retrieval arc, he's the team leader, but he fails the mission. He finally gets reparations when he successfully avenges Asuma in a mission led by him. His subplot could have ended right there, but then in the war, he has a small leadership role, and in the future, he's the Hokage's right-hand man. Once again, a subplot lasting multiple arcs. Chad from Bleach is another heavily criticized character, but he had a whole subplot about learning to protect his loved ones and it physically manifesting in his right arm. Then he had a subplot of enjoying fighting that manifested in his left arm. Or Hime, another heavily criticized character, also has a subplot of becoming a shield and healer for her allies. Other battle manga definitely give their characters subplots like these, but does JJK? I think one of the main reasons JJK stands out so much in this area is because it has a small cast of characters. When you can count most of the main characters on your fingers and most of them don't have subplots, it's really noticeable. Let's do a head count. Yuji has a subplot regarding Mahito. Megumi doesn't. Nobara doesn't. Gojo doesn't. Maki does regarding her lack of cursed energy. This is probably the most focused on subplot. Inumaki doesn't. Panda doesn't. Yuta doesn't. Mai doesn't. Mekumaru does have one regarding working with the villains. Miwa doesn't. Kami doesn't. Toto doesn't. Momo doesn't. Nanami doesn't. Meimei doesn't. Yuki doesn't. Do I need to keep going? I feel like mentioning any other characters would be unfair because these are the mainest ones. Out of all of these heroes, only three of them had a subplot. 
The severe deficiency made me realize how important subplots are to the quality of long-running stories, especially battle manga. And then there's the part that I'm sure most fans are aware of, deaths and incapacitations. The worst part about the deaths is that JJK kills characters who haven't had subplots or character arcs. Other stories would kill characters that have already completed their subplot. Examples would be Jiraiya and Neji and Naruto. JJK says, nah, I'm good. They killed Mekamaru, Nanami, Naobito, and Yuki, and incapacitated Inumaki and Obara. Only one of these characters had a subplot, Mekamaru. Yuki and Obara are the most frustrating. Yuki because she was hyped up as an elite sorcerer and she just showed up and lost without any arc or subplot. I know Naruto fans hate on Sanade, but at least she had a subplot and character arc. She was a well-written character from a character standpoint. Demon Slayer is another example of a manga with a frightening low amount of subplots. The only story arc I can confidently say had subplots was the Infinity Castle arc. However, the way the story goes about crossing out its characters is better. While they may not get subplots, they at least get flashbacks that develop their characters. Examples would be Rengoku and Tengen in the anime. In the manga, more characters die and all of them get flashbacks. What do we get from Yuki? And then Nobara. She's supposed to be the third main character, the third in the trio, yet she has no subplot, loses most of her fights, and then gets incapacitated for a long time. We don't even know if she's dead or alive. She was knocked out in Shibuya arc and has been missing for four straight arcs. So far, there are two payoffs that I remember being fumbled. One for Yuji, one for Megumi. Yuji has his whole subplot with Mahito. It starts with Mahito killing Junpei, a friend Yuji was trying to save. This was the start of Yuji becoming a little darker. Then Mahito showed up and killed Nanami, his teacher, and seemingly killed Nobara, an even closer friend. And then he beats the crap out of Yuji. When Toto shows up for round 2, Yuji finally has a chance to avenge his friends by killing Mahito, but Kenjaku interrupts and absorbs him? Like Nobara, I have no clue if he's gonna come back. But if that's actually the end, that's a fumbled payoff. Revenge stories are the easiest plots to pay off, and somehow, JJK missed the mark. The second is with Megumi and his sister. Tsubiki has been in a coma since the start, and Megumi's goal has been to wake her up. The culling game awakes Sumiki, and Megumi wants to get her out safely. He finally meets her, but it turns out that a reincarnated spirit has control over her body. After Sukuna takes over Megumi's body, he fights the spirit in Sumiki's body, Yorozu, and kills her in battle. Because of the way this is executed, I completely forgot that this meant that Sumiki is actually dead. If they wanted to go the sad road and kill the sister, cool, but the execution was atrocious. Tsukuna using Megumi's body to kill Sumiki is a good plan, but the problem is that Sumiki isn't in control of her body. Some crazy sorcerer from the past is. She isn't conscious. On top of that, Yorozu's corny infatuation with Sukuna is what's dominating the screen time rather than the fact that Megumi is about to kill his sister. When Yorozu died, it took time for it to really settle that Sumiki was dead too. After her death in 219, we got a two-panel reaction from Megumi. No words, and the panels didn't convey much emotion. The story pulled attention away from Sumiki's tragedy in order to focus on Yorozu's comedy. That's tough. Instead of effectively paying off the setup for one of the main characters, we got a Toradora rom-com. JJK's curse techniques has the potential to be one of the best power systems of all time, but its lack of exploration is so infuriating. The main one is domain expansion. These are the Bankais of JJK, but unlike Bankais and Bleach, we don't get to see enough. In 200 chapters, which characters have domains? Takuna, Jogo, Gojo, Dagon, Mahito, Megumi, Smallpox, Hiromi, Kinji, Naoya, Kenjaku, and Yorozu. That's 12 characters. Do you see a problem with this list? I do. The heroes, you know the main characters, are lacking in domains. Takuna, Jogo, Dagon, Mahito, and Kenjaku are the villains. Smallpox, Hiromi, and Yorozu are all one-arc villains. Naoya is a two-arc villain. Gojo, Megumi, and Kinji are the only heroes with domains. What are we doing? Why are there more throwaway characters with domains than actual heroes? I'm gonna be blunt. I want to see the characters I'm familiar with use domains, not just random one-off characters and villains. Furthermore, Yuki, Yuta, Ryu, and Uro all have domains, but none of them were actually shown. Yuta still has a chance to show his, but Yuki, Ryu, and Uro are all dead. So that's three fumbles right there. If Yuta doesn't show his by the end of the story, that'll be a fourth. Jichike's first domain was introduced in chapter 15. We're currently in the 230s. In 215 chapters, there have been 12 domain expansions. The first Bankai was used in chapter 125. 230 chapters later is 355. By that chapter, if we count all the Bankais and Bankai equivalents, like Resurrection, there have been 9 Bankais and 27 Resurrections. 
That's 36 Bankai equivalents in the same time span. Meanwhile, JJK has us waiting in the dark, likely to never see the light. What's worse is that there are characters that could have been given domains. Nobara, Inumaki, Yuta, Yuta has one but it hasn't been shown, Masamichi, Yoshinobu, Mekamaru, Kamo, Toto, Nanami, Meimei, and Yugi. If Megumi is able to have an incomplete one, I believe most of these students should be able to at least create an incomplete form, while the adults definitely should have one. Such a cool concept is going untapped. The next wasted concept is Curse Technique Reversal. Reverse Curse Technique, Hanten Jujutsu Shiki, is healing. Curse Technique Reversal, Jujutsu Shiki Hanten, is when a user reverses their Curse Technique lapse, Jujutsu Shiki Junten. Ever since Gojo explained how Red was a reversal of his lapse, I was so excited to see other characters reverse their moves. But we've only gotten one other in Chapter 204. One of Kenjaku's powers is Anti-Gravity System, which negates gravity. But during his fight with Chozo and Yuki, he only used the reversal, which creates a strong force of gravity. This was revealed in 208. In 200 plus chapters, the only examples of reversals are Gojo's and Kenjaku's. I thought we'd at least get to see Megumi, Nobara, and Toto reverse their moves. But no, this is wasted too. Next is Maximum Techniques. You probably forgot these because only three people used them. Ghetto, Esso, and Jogo. Two important antagonists and one irrelevant one-time villain. A concept of the power system that's been poorly explored is Inherited Techniques. The story hypes up the three great sorcerer families as Zenin, Gojo, and Kamo. Zenins have the 10 shadows. How many people can use that? One. Gojos have Limitless and Six Eyes. How many people can use that? One. Kamos have blood manipulation. And how many people can use that? Two. What are we doing here? The Zenins also have a second ability, Projection Sorcery. Only two people can use that. What is the point of making a family ability if barely any family members use it? The Uchihas and Naruto were nearly wiped out, yet we see more Sharingan users there. Black Clover does this better too, although it's a little different. One noble family uses water, another family uses fire. We can see at least three members from each family using their family magic. And then there are some abilities that just haven't been properly explored. The first is Panda. He has a third form, but just as he activated it, he was destroyed. I don't know if he's ever going to come back and use it. Kinji has his domain explained, but his actual curse technique is barely elaborated on or used. We just see him summon some doors and telekinetically control them. How is his domain more clear than his curse technique? And the only time he used it was on Yuji. And then there's Yuji. Very early on in the story, Gojo hinted that Yuji would develop his own technique. In chapter 222, Fans believe that his ability has been shown to be body swapping. Regardless, it took way too long for Yuji Itadori, the main protagonist, to get his ability. With him getting it this late, I don't know if I'll ever get to see his lapse, reversal, or domain, and that's a major disappointment. In conclusion, the focus on side quests, the wasted characters, the fumbled payoffs, and the unexplored power system are the reasons that Jujutsu Kaisen has been a disappointment so far. Some of these problems can actually be fixed. Side quest syndrome is not one. No matter how focused the story gets from here on, all that loitering at the start will never go away. The wasted characters who are still alive can become unwasted by being given a subplot. The fumbled payoffs cannot be fixed. The power system can become more explored but the characters who already died before showing off all their moves will never be made up for. I'm not saying the story is trash, far from it. It's just also far from the expectations I had of it. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, share, subscribe, and help me revolutionize the manga industry by buying my manga and spreading the word. All important links will be in the description.